So we're into chapter 8 of Nehemiah, and the, the people are gathering as one man on the first day of the seventh month. That was in verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, it says of chapter 8, and he read from it, he read from this, the book of the law, from it before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Here we got, he's reading, and people are there from early morning to midday. I mean, this is, this is dedication. They're just listening to him read the law. I mean, he's reading like, what is he reading? Well, like Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. I mean, he's going through that. And it says, uh, verse 4, And Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium, which they had made for, the, for, for that purpose, for the purpose. And beside him stood all these other guys. Okay, I'm not going to read their names. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, verse 5, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. So he opens the book, and out of honor, this is an amazing day. They're all come together at one man, as one man. They're united. They come together on this day. They want to hear what God said in the law. They haven't heard it. They haven't heard it. They don't know what, it, they don't know what the, book, the Bible says. Their Bible, their book of the law, they, they have no idea what it says. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces on the ground. And uh, it says also, listen, a group of people here explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. And in verse 8, And they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that the, they understood the reading. So here they're, they're reading through it. The people have come together. They're so enthused. When, when Ezra stands up to read, they stand up. They bow down. You know, they're sitting there, and there's all this group, the group of Levites there to help explain what, what's being said. So we get to verse 9. Then Nehemiah, who is the governor. So we're in the book of Nehemiah. We're talking about Ezra right now reading the book. But then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. They're listening to the law and they're realizing, we have been doing that. We could be in a heap of trouble. And I think more than that, at this point, there was such a fervor. It's like, we're, we're uh, displeasing to God. We're, we're hurting his heart. We're, we're not doing you know, what, he, what he's asked of us. And he's done all these great thing for us, things for us, even bringing us back to Jerusalem and restoring the temple and putting it in Cyrus's heart to give this decree and all of this stuff. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing time, and they're, ju they're just, uh, so they're weeping. And, uh, and, and so Nehemiah says, don't weep. And then he said to them, verse 10, go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, and here it is, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I mean, this is the one that we know on the first day of the seventh month in this year when they, is when they said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's been a verse that's been used for a lot of different situations, sermons, etc. And here we see that he's saying, you know, although you're moved by what you, your disobedience, but he says, I want you to begin to rejoice here, I'll give praise to God, be happy, celebrate, eat and, and drink. It's a time of celebration. So in verse 11, so, so the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. Verse 12, And all the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words which had been known, had uh, been made known to them. So, yeah, I kept thinking I read that wrong. But anyway, they, they understood finally the words of the law, and uh, they knew they were in disobedience, but now they have the law restored, and they've got a guideline for how to live their lives, and they're pretty excited. So we get to chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Now on the 24th day of this month, seventh month of the sons of Israel, assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dirt. So they finished their celebration, now they're fasting and repenting again. And it says, And the descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. So... Uh, after they had this time of celebration, they realized we've sinned. You know, we've had this time, we've celebrated, whatever. But at the end of it, the 24th day, uh, we know that uh, the Feast of Tabernacles went from the 15th to the 22nd day, and then on the 23rd day, there was a, a, a final kind of Sabbath celebration. So this is the 24th day. After the Feast of Tabernacles is completely over with, 
they have this time of fasting and confessing their sins and iniquities of their forefathers. They realize they've, they've sinned. This is, this, we read this in Daniel. When we get to Daniel, we'll read that too. Where Daniel began to confess the sins of his forefathers. Uh, just, you know, in petition to the Lord that we've sinned as a people. Please cover us as a people. Not only me, but my, my uh, ancestors. So we're going to skip ahead to chapter 13 because a lot of this is, is covered in different ways and it's a designation of different people and what they're doing and the dedication of the wall, which is important and all of that procedures in the temple. But in first, chapter 13, verse 1, it says, On that day they read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. This was written in Deuteronomy, because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it came about that when they heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. So here they, they're hearing the law, and no Ammonite or Moabite is, all, Moabite is allowed in the assembly of God. I don't know if you remember the book of Ruth. Who was Ruth? Well, Ruth was a Moabite, you know, and but they were excluded. But it just shows it's not just a matter of just the people. If a person has a heart towards God, everyone is welcome to him. Ruth is actually included in the line, the lineage of Jesus. But it says here, no Ammonite or Moabite can enter the assembly of God. And it's because uh, the, some of these uh, I think were, were known as merchants, too, which is interesting in our day. You know, merchants not allowed in the assembly of God. Anyway, uh, make a good sermon for somebody. Um, but so they go in, and in verse 6 it says, But during all this time I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king, and some time, however, I asked to leave from the king. So... Nehemiah wasn't in Jerusalem. Now he's coming to Jerusalem because the king said he could. And I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah. Now Tobiah was the one that was really standing against the building of the temple and that kind of thing. He was, he was not a good guy. And they prepared a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it was very displeasing to me, so I threw, out, I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of, out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned their, the utensils of the house of God, and the grain offerings, and the frankincense. This is a, you know, once again, it's a picture. Ezra and Nehemiah is a restoration time, a cleaning up time. And here he just goes in. They, they've got a, a guy who's anti-God serving in the temple of God. He's got a special place. And Nehemiah has such a, a fervency. He just goes in, takes his stuff, and throws it out the door. You know, he's going to cleanse this place. He's going to kick it out. And then we see that the tithes are restored, the Sabbath is restored, you know, they're restoring the building of the temple, the utensils in the temple are restored. All of these things are being restored. It's, this is really a time of restoration, and it's an exciting time because now the people of God are getting a place, a habitation, a place they identify with against that's theirs, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture, it's a it's, it, it's right before them of a place where God is going to meet with them, and God is the God of, of Israel. And so we get to the end of chapter 13, and I look at verse 23. This is the same incident that we read about in Ezra. But let, listen to this. In those days I saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, Ammon, and Moab. As for their children, half spoke the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah but the language of his own people. So I contended with them. Listen what, what Nehemiah does. I contended with them, cursed them, struck some of them, pulled out their hair, made them swear by God, you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take of your daughters for your sons or for yourselves. So we see this mixed marriage problem in breaking in the, bringing in the gods of the other nations. And in Ezra, Ezra uh, tore his clothes, pulled out his hair, pulled out his beard, and that kind of thing, and sat down appalled. Well, Nehemiah, uh, cursed them, hit them, struck them, pulled up, tore, tore out their hair. And my question to you is, who do you want for your pastor? Do you want Ezra <laughs> or Nehemiah? You know, and the, the picture here is Ezra was a priest who, in, in essence, was was one who would make intercession, stand between you and God. And uh, but uh, you know, Nehemiah is more concerned with justice. He's a he's a government official trying to cleanse the place up, and he knows who the offenders are. It wasn't him; it's you. And so he goes and he. He uh, hits them, <laughs> tears out their hair. So, you know, there's times I think people in ministry would would rather be uh, Nehemiah than Ezra. 
<laughs> I've heard that said. I'm going to end with just the last two verses of Nehemiah 13. Thus I purified them from everything foreign and appointed duties for the priests and the Levites, each in his task. And I arranged for the supply of wood at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. So Nehemiah is just the, the, the whole picture here is we're restoring everything back to the place it should be. We've read the law. We know where we're supposed to be. Lord, remember me. We're, we're, we're putting things back in order. And it's really a time of excitement here as they come back and God's restoring uh, the Jews to their to Israel and to the temple.